Hello, it's John Logan. I'm back with another video on philosophy. Uh, and today, I thought I would talk about Edmund Husserl. Edmund Husserl is one of my favorite philosophers. Um, and I'll talk about kind of what he did a little bit. But just really quick background. Edmund Husserl lived in the time uh, late 19th century to into the 20th century. So he's fairly recent. Um, he's a contemporary thought. And he's most known for being the founder, or at least one of the prominent founders, of phenomenology. And phenomenology is a newer kind of philosophical thought or methodology. Um, personally, it's one I adhere to. Uh, I think phenomenology has a lot to offer, um, and I think it can be harmonized uh, with the Catholic life um, in its method. And I'll kind of talk about that a little bit as the video goes on. But really quick, before I go into what is phenomenology, I want to kind of just mention, uh, give it a little credibility, um, and mention a fact about Edmund Husserl um, that's kind of neat, especially for Catholics. Um, he was not Christian. Uh, unfortunately, he never converted to Catholicism, but he did convert to Christianity, and he converted through his assistant, who he would uh, be very fond of, and I'm going to mention uh, who his assistant is in just a moment. Um, but kind of some notable phenomenologists to kind of give it a, a bit of credibility. Um, Max Scheler was a very prominent phenomenologist. Uh, Martin Heidegger, um, he was more of an, in an existential phenomenology. Um, I confess I'm not as familiar with Heidegger's philosophy uh, as I wish I was. Um, but I'm more familiar with these uh, other names. Mikkel de Frein, he's a French philosopher. Uh, he wrote prominently in aesthetics. Uh, he has a great work, Phenomenology of Aesthetic Experience. That is a really rich account of uh, aesthetics, but also kind of the phenomenological methodology. Um, really great account. Um, yeah, so if, if you ever want a great uh, read, I recommend Phenomenology of Aesthetic Experience by Mikhail Dufresne. Very great read. Now, these next two are uh, very prominent. Uh, their names are Edith Stein and Kara Wojtyla. Um And if, if you're Catholic, you might uh, recognize those names, or you would perhaps most definitely recognize them, in that Edith Stein would become Saint Sister Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, and John Paul, or uh, Kara Wojtyla would become Pope St. John Paul II. Um, now, I confess Pope St. John Paul II was not just primarily a phenomenologist, uh, he definitely adhered to it, uh, followed a lot of its methodology, but uh, I, I'll talk about that a little later in the video of because he's going to come back up. Um, but he uh, adhered to not just primarily phenomenology, he's going to have other influences for sure. Um, so that kind of gives an account. And Edith Stein, what makes her uh, very prominent for Husserl is Edith Stein was actually his assistant in 1916 through 1918. And it was Edith Stein who converted... Uh, who had such an impact and would later on convert uh, Husserl. And uh, she had just a, a wonderful impact on him, and he was very fond of her. Um, uh, he actually went on to say that it, if she ever got married, he would want to be the one to, to give her away. Uh, so he just was, he very much uh, had a deep respect for her philosophy, but also you could kind of see like a fatherly love in him for her. So that's a little background into Husserl and his associates, but what is phenomenology? Uh, so uh, to start it off, it, it focuses on, pretty obvious, the phenomena. And what phenomena, phenomena means is two things. Experiencing, so phenomenology is going to deal with experiences, but also it means appearing. So it's going to focus on things that appear, things that manifest itself. And to kind of give, I think, an appropriate uh, account or introduction to phenomenology, you might say, I think you have to bring up one of the modern philosophers, René Descartes. And why am I bringing up Descartes? Because Descartes, um, or Husserl is going to kind of take a little bit from Descartes, but I think as hopefully you're going to see throughout this video, he's going to take his thought and kind of turn it upside down. Um, so he's... he's He's going to take it upside down, but he's going to take something from Descartes. And what is it? Descartes would propose that we cannot know there is reality, right? Because in Descartes' meditations, for him, perception deceives us. And if perception deceives us and, and my senses deceive me, right, how can I know that there's actually reality, right? So he was very radical in that. And so he's going to actually say that there perhaps is no reality. We can't know that there is a reality. We can't, you know, be objective about that. 
Um, but perception, his idea of perception, that's where Husserl's going to take off. Um, and so with that, right, introducing phenomenology, uh, I want to introduce it firstly in a couple ways. Um, I'm going to talk about bracketing and then intentionality. Uh, and bracketing is the place to start because that is kind of where Husserl starts. And what is bracketing? It's kind of like the math equation, right, where you have A plus B plus C equals D, but you kind of want to focus on what is A plus B, or say it's A times B plus C, you're going to bracket that, and you're going to focus on the A times B, and you're going to hold off on the, the plus C part. So this is what he's going to do. He's going to bracket, but what is he bracketing? It's not a math equation. He's not bracketing A plus or A times B. What he's bracketing is what he's going to call the natural attitude. He's going to say we need to suspend the thesis of the natural attitude. But what is that? The natural attitude can be very can be found to be pretty much synonymous with kind of Hume's empiricism, this idea of seeing is believing. And I remember, he's around the time of David Hume, and David Hume was radically empiricist, right? And what is empiricism? Empiricism, excuse me. Empiricism is this idea that reality, we can only know reality as we can see it, as we can touch it, as we can measure it, right? It's very scientific in its method, right? In science, we deal with facts with only what we can measure, with only right, what we can test. If it's not testable, it's not real, right? And so radical empiricism like Hume would suggest something like God is not real because we can't test it, we can't measure it, um, and we can't see it. So that's kind of this empiricism. And it's this idea, right, that seeing is believing. So it, it, it's a, the idea that if you see something, you have to posit its existence. You have to posit its certainty, right? And this is where Husserl is going to kind of take with Descartes. Right? I said he kind of takes away from Descartes, um, but he's not Cartesian. That's going to be clear. Phenomenology is not Cartesian, but he is going to take this thing from Descartes in that perception does lie to us. It can. Not always, but it can lie to us. It can deceive us. And Husserl is going to see that. Like, think about it. You're walking on the streets, and you think you saw your friend. You see someone, you totally thought it was your friend. Right? In the natural attitude, right, seeing something is believing Right? So if you see something, it, you have to posit the existence, the certainty of it. But that could, be to that could be someone else. You may have thought you saw LeBron James walking by you on the streets, and it turns out it was not LeBron James. Right? So, so in a certain sense, perception can deceive us. Right? And he's, but he's not, Husserl is not going to be as radical as uh, Descartes and just say, therefore, I can't know anything. He's actually going to turn that upside down. It's going to be neat um, how he does that. But... So so perception can deceive us, and so this is why he wants to turn and suspend the natural thesis, because we can't just posit something's existence just because of seeing is believing. He's he's not a fan of that, right? He wouldn't be a fan of that thesis, right? And, and there's a couple reasons why, because think about it. it. If seeing is believing and you just see something, you're kind of taking for granted existence. If you're just positing existence based off what you see, you're already taking for granted existence. Also, another reason why Husserl's going to critique it is because Husserl's going to want to focus on subjectivity, and I'll come back to that a little later. But he want, he's going to call for a self-reflection uh, in his phenomenological method, right? And, and if you think about that, you don't get that with the natural attitude. You don't get that in empiricism, right? If a... Some, if a scientist is conducting an experiment, he doesn't need to have any sort of self-reflection to, to perform this task. He doesn't need to have a self-reflection of who he is when he's uh, doing a chemical test or, or some physics, right, measuring physics. Um, right. So there's no self-reflection. So in a certain sense, Husserl's going to see and notify that in the natural attitude, you almost take for granted your very self. You don't want to take for granted your own ex existence, Right? And so we really see that a natural attitude really can fall short. Not that it's just wrong, right? We're not saying that, like, the science is just evil or this natural attitude is evil. But we're going to show that, right, we need, we need more. We need, we need to bracket it, right? That's, that's why it's a bracketing method, right? You're not ditching it and throwing it away. Not these existential values, so to speak. But you're bracketing it, and you're going to focus on something else. And this is what he's saying this is where he goes to phenomena. we got to focus on the phenomena. We turn to the phenomenological attitude. 
And where this starts, now that we've got bracketing, right? We've got bracketing out of the way. We're going to turn to the second thing. And that's intentionality. This can be seen as pretty much the heart of phenomenology, uh, in a sense. So intentionality. Um, what is intentionality? It's not like I'm going to be intentional or how you might just see it. It's not as broad as that. Like I'm going to be intentional with my time. In a sense, you could kind of see a similarity, but... That's very broad, right? And what does he mean by this? Well, intentionality in its most basic definition is the consciousness of an object. So consciousness, not conscious, not like growing a conscious, but consciousness. So, and that's a big thing in phenomenology is the conscious um, consciousness of something. Um, so in its definition, it's a consciousness of an object. So a subject perceiving an object. So like you right now, if you're watching this video, uh, you are conscious of the computer in front of you. You are you are the subject and you're conscious of this object, right? Or if you see someone, you're conscious of someone you see, right? So that's what intentionality is. But he's going to keep building up. Because remember, he's building a philosophy here. And philosophy, right, what we do in philosophy is we try to find universals. We try to find essences, right? And so you can't really necessarily just say you okay the the computer appears to me or this object appears to me in intentionality and i found the essence you know that's that's a little ridiculous but Husserl is going to think we can find the essences essences excuse me and the meaning of things by studying the phenomena but how do we get there so if we have this intentionality if we're consciousness of an object the object in some way is present to you but is it fully present? This is something Husserl's going to question, and it's something uh, that phenomenologist Mikhail Dufresne I mentioned in his Phenomenology of Aesthetic Experience. He's going to be a little more explicit about this, and it's a very neat discourse. Nonetheless, we're talking about Husserl, so back to Husserl, and he he's very much is still in this idea of presence. Is the object that's appearing to me fully manifest to me? And in a certain sense, maybe not. Maybe, and as Husserl would propose, we need to perform an action for it to manifest itself. Okay, so what does that mean? Perform an action to right. We have the subject. We're viewing. We're consciousness of an object. What do we mean when what's appearing to us? We need to perform an action that it manifests, right? Because he would say that the object will manifest itself provided that we perform the right action. Well, if you think about it this way, we could use some examples. Um, think about counting, right? If if I hold the three fingers up, right, what's appearing to you is my hand with three fingers. But how do you know it's three? You have to perform the action of counting, right? You perform the action of counting and in the appearing, my hand, and the action of counting, you come to three, right? So you're actually coming to a meaning deeper than the appearing, right? So the, the object becomes manifested through the performance of the action, right? The right action. Or another example could be with language, right? You could have a book. Say you have a book and it's in uh, Polish, right? You have a book in Polish. Now, I can't read Polish. Am I fully present to this text? In a sense, no. I mean, it's present right before me. I, I actually don't have a book in front of me. But pretend there is a book in front of me, right? In, in a sense, it's physically present, but I'm not fully present to it, right? I have to perform the action of learning the language of Polish, of uh, the Poles, right to in order to read this then i'm actually present this object manifests right and if i read the book then i can understand the meaning of the book right because you can't understand the meaning just simply with the book appearing before you you actually have to perform the action of reading it understanding the language then you come to the meaning so aha now Husserl doesn't seem so crazy when he's saying we can come to the essences and the meaning of things by studying phenomena it's actually quite brilliant um so this is what this is what he means in intentionality this is the heart of phenomenology it is intentionality subject consciousness of an object and now the object has manifested itself provided that the subject has performed the correct action right as we saw with the language as we saw with the counting right but Husserl goes further and this is perhaps one of the most beautiful profound things in phenomenology that Husserl talks about and this is, he says, correlation. He thinks there will be a correlation. When you perform this action, there becomes a correlation between the subject and the object. So, right, so we have subject, we have object, we have an arrow, intentionality, 
And then now we have a correlation, right? There's a relationship between subject and object. And it places the subject in what Husserl is going to call the dative of manifestation. Now, dative, if you study like ancient languages or understand what dative means, what it is like in Latin um, or in other languages, right? The dative is like the to and the for something, right? That's the dative. It deals with the indirect object. And so it's the two, four. So if we understand the dative of manifestation, what Husserl means by this in developing this intentionality with this correlation, this object, you're not simply just conscious of an object, but this object is appearing to me, right? In the dative of manifestation, to or for something. So it appears to me. So they're establishing this relationship. So think about that in terms of how Husserl's turning Descartes' theory of, of existence upside down. Not only is there existence and there's their reality, because you're conscious of an object. And let me go through that really quick, because I'll uh, nail the, or hammer the nail in really quick with how he's going to prove existence. So think about it. If you have a mug or if you have a cup and you're turning it around and you're constantly turning around, you can't see all of it at once. I really should have started with this actually at the beginning. But you can't see all of the mug at once, right? And so for Husserl, he's going to understand we can't contain essences and the material of things in our minds, right? And no matter how we depict the image in our mind, we can't look at all of it at once. And so through this, he understands that the essences aren't contained just in my mind, like Descartes would propose. Everything I think, therefore I am, Descartes said. Right? It all starts in my consciousness, and it stays there. Right? There's this doxa of belief. But now Husserl understands that it's outside of my mind. It's outside of my consciousness. Right? That consciousness of an object, that intentionality, it exists outside of me. And so that's how he turns uh, the Cartesian thought upside down for reality. He's actually going to see he shows and proves that there is reality. But now if we go back to this date of a manifestation, not only is there reality, but this reality is appearing to me. And if we look at this in the other form of the date of manifestation, this reality, this existence, this creation is appearing for me. Right? Do you see how that, what that does in the date of manifestation? It appears for me. Right? It puts this idea of like as if creation was a gift, which is something that... Pope St. John Paul II would talk about in his Theology of the Body, which comprises his Wednesday audiences, right? In his Hermeneutics of the Gift, where man realizes through his subjectivity, through his phenomenal experience of creation, that creation is a gift for him, right? So it almost seems like Husserl is kind of referring to that, right? In the date of a manifestation, that this exists to me, this exists for me, right? There's this idea of gift, hidden underneath now he's not going to explicitly say that but that notion is hidden there and he certainly is hammering the idea that existence exists in a sense is appearing for me to me and that's a very neat concept in phenomenology it totally switches and i think this is what provides it a deeper insight than than past philosophical traditions like the aristotelian methodology or the platonic right is it's it's a relationship between the subject and the object, right? And so Hasra has really found a certain subjectivity in man. Subjectivity not to be confused with subjectivism, right? Subjectivism would be purely off of man's feelings, purely off of subjective standpoint. There, man is purely subjective. But subjectivity, right, would be this idea that man is a subject in a world of objects, which, by the way, is how Karawitia, Pope St. John Paul II, would start love and responsibility, because he, he understood the importance of this. But subjectivity, right? Man is a subject in a world of objects. And so in understanding this, man has this very personal experience, right? This is this personalistic tradition of philosophy coming out. Man has this personal experience, but it's not just subjective. Man is an object, right? Because when you are a subject consciousness of an object, that can be a human, but they're not merely an object, right? They're both subject and object. Something Edith Stein would develop in her uh, treaties of the individual and community in her philosophy of psychology. Uh, but Husserl is very much hammering this down, right? He's very much hammering the subjectivity of man and very much hammering down this dative of manifestation. And I think it's very beautiful because it shows forth this very unique experience, right? I mean, phenomena, the experiencing. 
but it's still grounded in an objective standpoint. So it really is a credible philosophical tradition, right? Because we understood that you still can come to the meaning of things. You still can understand essences, right? And we saw in the example of the counting, the example of reading a text, right? Performing the right action. And so that's what hospital is really going to develop into is phenomenology. And so to kind of recap that, right? It starts with the bracketing. You suspend the natural thesis, the natural attitude, right? That kind of sort of empiricism. So once you bracket that, you turn to the phenomenological attitude and you enter into that idea of intentionality, right? Subject consciousness of an object, thereby you perform the right action, then the object manifests itself, right? Provided that you perform the right action. Then there's the correlation that puts the subject in the dative of manifestation, and that shows a sort of subjectivity of man, a personal experience, but also grounded in objectivity. So that is how Husserl would develop phenomenology, and that's kind of an introduction into it. So really quick, some, some concluding remarks. How is this kind of applicable for the Catholic? Well, I think it's already, we, I kind of mentioned it already with kind of how Kara Wojtyla or Pope St. John Paul II would develop this, right? This idea of subjectivity showing forth a uniqueness of man, showing forth a very personal, right, the personalistic experience of man, which is a uh, relatively contemporary as well, contemporary thought of philosophy. Although you can kind of see some pre-personalistic uh, thought in the medievals, uh, but that's that's a whole another another thing. Um, so right, the subjectivity. I think that's a beautiful thing that Husserl's identifying, and I think that's beautiful for the Catholic, right? That we understand that there is objectivity, right? We are objects, but we're not merely objects, as as Caraboitia would propose in Love and Responsibility. But we are also subjects, and so there's this personal experience we have. So Husserl is finding that, and I think that's very applicable for the Catholic life. But I think also what's applicable is what I've talked about, I think, a lot, is um, the date of a manifestation. I think this is beautiful, and it's very clear in Moitia, um, or Pope St. John Paul II, in his Theology of the Body, with the hermeneutics of the gift, right? That, this, uh, that what appears to me becomes this gift for me, right? So this idea of gift, and I think as Catholics, we really... Uh, this is so applicable for us, this idea of gift, right? What we're conscious of is appearing to me and for me, right? So the person we're conscious of, gift, reality, gift, creation, gift, it's beautiful, right? This is what, what is beautiful is appearing to and for me uh, in a certain sense. Now that's kind of being, uh, there's a whole philosophy into that as well, and I, I won't go into it, but it, right, this idea of gift, and I think that's so applicable to the Catholic life, and we can remind ourselves of that, that gift, gift, gift. What a gift creation is. What a gift our brothers and sisters we become consciousness of are. And so I think that is the beauty of phenomenology. Um, and I was going to mention something about uh, Carol Oitia. Um I did mention he was a phenomenologist. I, just really quick, I'll mention... He is a phenomenologist, uh, Pope St. John Paul II. He very much adhered to it, and he uses his method, or that method. Uh, you see it prevalent in all his writings, um, or at least most of them. But uh, just a couple, to clarify, he's not just squarely a phenomenologist. He is grounded in the Augustinian tradition as well, in scriptural and biblical studies through Augustine and the Platonic thought. But uh, he's also very much, and probably more prominently than the Augustinian, he's very much grounded in the Thomistic thought and Thomistic metaphysics. Uh, but he very much loves phenomenology and the personalistic vision simply because of the subjectivity of man, uh, this personal approach to man, and which is his basic thesis for love and responsibility. He bases it off the personalistic thought. But now I'm getting into Kara Waitia, and that was not the video. So Edmund Husserl. Edmund Husserl, this is phenomenology. What a beautiful school of thought, and I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and if you do, please like it and share it, and I hope it was informative for you.